the War of 1812. So, with the War of 1812, Madison, as well as his advisors, really see as like Canada as like right for the taking. This is due to a few different reasons. Um, two out of every three Canadians were actually native born in the Americas. And so they basically assume that these Canadians would welcome the United States Army with open arms. Um, on top of that, there's only about 5,000 British troops there in Canada at this time. And that combined with the Canadian militia, they're clearly outnumbered by Americans. So um, while this war was all about, you know, defending America's neutrality on the high seas, there's no way America could actually have the ships do much against the British Navy. So really, largely, this is actually going to be a land war. And a lot of the naval engagements we talk about are actually going to be on the Great Lakes. Um, Madison might have had a very clear strategic vision, but the execution of this is going to be, quite frankly, pathetic. Uh, for instance, just looking at the year of 1812, there are three different offenses against Canada, and all of them are failures. Uh, for example, uh, General William Hull would go on to invite Canadians to join in the American cause, and yet he found very few takers. And while he was up in Canada, Tecumseh, his warriors actually cut off Hull's communications, so much so that he had to hurry back to Detroit only to end up surrendering his army to a smaller British Indian force in August of that year. On top of that, there's things like the massacre of the inhabitants at Fort Dearborn, which is near uh, present day Chicago. And basically these two things combined exposed all of the American Western settlements to just the fury of frontier warfare. In fact, by the end of 1812, Great Britain controls about half of the Old Northwest. Um, we see further back to the East, Americans would botch two other offensives during 1812, and actually a third would end in a bloodless fiasco that was aimed at Montreal. Literally, the only American victories in this first year were some small morale boosting, but quite frankly, insignificant naval victories. But these were easy pickings and these were soon gone once the British uh, naval squadrons were redeployed to basically protect their shipping as well as other warships. And they're going to even set up a blockade that really stifles American commerce. So you have all these military support, uh, setbacks and anti-war feeling and this actually really hurt Republicans during the election of 1812 which is when um, Madison is going for re-election. All the same, Madison is going to win, but it's a much more narrow victory. Uh, very much familiar regional patterns we're seeing that we're seeing the West and the South are basically voting for uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans, which is Madison in this case. Um, he does poorly in the Northeast, but he does win partly because he did take Pennsylvania. Now, when you go to the next year of the war, 1813, Americans do do better. Uh, for instance, their Navy would win an engagement on Lake Erie um, that basically, this is the Battle of Put-in-Bay and this American naval victory um, has two consequences. First of all, it means that it denies the British a strategic control over the Great Lakes, but it also opens up a supply line into the Western theater for Americans to get more supplies out to their Western troops. Uh, the British then would be forced to abandon Detroit. We also see during this year, William Henry Harrison, um, the, a general at this point, would catch up with the British and actually battle with Tecumseh. And Tecumseh would be killed in this engagement. And basically when he dies, the backbone of Indian resistance is broken. So at this point, the Old Northwest is once again safe for American settlement. This also ends any kind of plan maybe to have an Indian buffer state in this region. So this brings us to 1814. Now in 1814, European powers had forced Napoleon to abdicate. This basically frees up the British to really focus on the war with the United States at this point. And they're going to plan two really big things. They're going to plan firstly an invasion all the way from Montreal to Lake Champlain, or Champlain, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, all the way from there down to like New York. 
And they also plan for an invasion of Louisiana, specifically at New Orleans. Basically, they wanted to reverse a lot of America's expansion in the past. Now, while America may have been doing better in the war, there's a lot of problems internally at this point in time. Uh, for instance, the United States Treasury was nearly bankrupt, partly because they had refused to preserve the Bank of the United States when the charter expired in 1811. Uh, they could only rely on makeshift loans. Inflation also was a rampant issue because a lot of the states were just over-issuing paper money and banknotes. And then, of course, the British blockade in New England really upset them as well. And so a lot of Americans, even doing better in the war, wanted an end to the so-called Mr. Madison's War. On top of that, in 1814, in August, a British amphibious force would actually occupy and torch the United States capital of Washington, D.C. Now, Americans are going to resist here, but really what helps them the most is that there's just no follow-up attack. And so this basically deprives the British of any kind of strategic gain they might have had by taking over the United States' actual capital. Uh, this is actually when Francis Scott Key wrote the Star-Spangled Banner. Now, the reason they had attacked Washington, D.C. also was supposed to be to divert American attention away from the shores of Lake Champlain. But um, Commodore Thomas McDowell actually ends up defeating the British at the Battle of Plattsburgh on September 11th. At this point, the British were ready to um, ready for peace, basically, even though they're still planning that invasion of New Orleans. So, on Christmas Eve of 1814, both parties will sign the Treaty of Ghent. This basically restores the relationship between America and Great Britain to their status from the start of the war. Still, the British are planning that invasion of Louisiana, and they're sending reinforcements. They saw the Louisiana Purchase basically as fraudulent, and they basically wanted to install their own government in Louisiana if they succeed here. So this is going to lead to the Battle of New Orleans in January of 1815. Really, the hero out of this is going to be Andrew Jackson, a future president of the United States. The thing is, Andrew Jackson had actually already rose to prominence during the War of 1812 by being this like ferocious Indian fighter. He had crushed Indian resistance in the Old Southwest. He was really well known for slaughtering Creek warriors and actually proceeded to make them cede about two thirds of their land to the United States. Um, really quick, as much as this war is really complicated, uh, one thing that is very clear, the biggest loser of this war would unfortunately be but unsurprisingly, the Native Americans. Anyway, back to Andrew Jackson. He had then gone on to be promoted to general, and he had been given command of the defense of the West Coast. Now, the British are basically overconfident, and they basically decide to attack Jackson's lines directly from the front, and the British are annihilated. This ends any possibility about the British having a sphere within Louisiana. It's also a death blow to federalism because basically the federalists were seen as having taken regional interests as more important than the national good. And people, basically the federalists had struck many as being quasi traitors because they had been prepared to desert the country in the face of the enemy. This is that small group that had thought about um, seceding the Union and New England and everything. So I ask you, as a part of your journal, summarize the War of 1812 in one sentence. 